And welcome everyone, thanks for joining. This is my first virtual workshop. I hope you enjoy today, come away with a useful new skill. All right, so this is the fuzzing with AFL workshop. Um, you're gonna come away from today knowing what fuzzing is, knowing what AFL is, American Fuzzy Lop, the tool we're gonna be using and being able to use it to fuzz the programs of your choice. So what's the agenda? We're going to start off with an intro to fuzzing and what AFL is. Then we will start with fuzzing a little toy program, not a real program, but just to see how the tool works. Um, and then spend a little bit more in-depth time looking at what happened there um, and how test harnesses work in general. Um, so you understand the mechanics. Then I'm going to talk quite a bit about the practical aspects of AFL, the different different options you've got, the different challenges and how to overcome them. Then we're going to start doing some challenges. So these are a set of real world vulnerabilities that have been pulled together for this workshop that you can rediscover with, with fuzzing. So these are CVEs in, in software from 2000, I think, um, to, to current day. Um, and together we'll we'll rediscover these vulnerabilities using AFL. Then we'll sort of wrap up with a bit more of me talking. Um, I'm going to cover some of the more advanced topics of using AFL, point you at a lot of resources for where to go if you want to carry on learning. Uh, and then that'll be the end of the presentation material, but it won't be the end of the workshop. There'll be another hour or so where you can carry on the challenges and I'll be available in Discord to, to continue supporting that. So what are we not going to cover? Um, the history of fuzzing is interesting, but we don't have time to focus on that today. Um, fuzzing targets that you don't have the source code to or that only listen on the network and you can't modify them to listen via some other mechanism. Um, both possible but not the focus of today. Today we're going to focus on open source software that you can modify um, or software within your own companies that you have the source code to. Um, we are going to be looking at specific techniques that are highly focused on individual targets. Um, you can obviously get good results by tailoring your approach, in a, your approach to fuzzing in a deep way to your target, um, but we're going to be looking at generic mechanisms that will work across a broad range of targets. Um, to that end, we're also going to stick to AFL, which is a generic fuzzer for, for fuzzing a lot of different targets, um, and a little bit of lib fuzzer as well. And I'll explain why we've picked that in a bit. Um, you can find a lot of bugs with fuzzing on your machine. If you want to find the most bugs with fuzzing, you do need to expand onto lots of different machines, um, scale your fuzzing. Um, it's kind of linear. It's not linear at all. <laughs> Um, but the more the more machines you have fuzzing, um, the more bugs you're going to find. Straightforward. Um, it's a big topic, and there's lots of different options. I'll highlight some of the options and, and the good approaches, but we won't actually practice with doing that today. Once you've found bugs with fuzzing, you need to understand how serious they are. Um, are they exploitable? If they are, what can you do with them? Um, that's the whole topic of crash triage, um, which then um, follows on into exploit development. Um, we're not covering that. It's nothing to do with fuzzing specifically. It's a generic topic. Um, it's an important one to learn um, if, you, if you do want to go more than I found a bug. Um, if you actually want to understand the details of that bug. And then finally, we're not going to cover like cutting edge research in fuzzing um, today. Okay, so a bit of background to fuzzing and why it's useful. Um, as we go through this, if you've got any questions at any stage, just ask them in Discord. Um, we have to wait to any particular moments. So I will inject a few pauses um, from time to time to give us a chance to catch up on questions. So at a very high level, software can be thought of as, any software can be thought of as a function that takes some input and gives some output. Um, it applies to any different scale of software. Um, your PowerPoint presentation software all the way through to a couple of lines of code. 
some input and there's some output. Um, as we know, sometimes an unexpected input can lead to a security flaw. Um, it's quite hard to identify what those unexpected inputs are or if they even exist. Um, the entire multi-billion dollar security industry exists because that's a hard problem. There's lots of different ways to try and find bugs in code. Um, there's some categories here on the screen. Um, dynamic analysis is one such category where you look at a running program and through your looking at it, you try and determine if there's a bug there. A security bug in particular is the type we're most interested in. Fuzzing is a type of dynamic analysis. So you, you run your program and at its simplest, you run it with some random input and you see if your program crashes or not. If it doesn't crash, you run it with a new random input. If it does crash, you found a bug. So that's all fuzzing is at a high level. Random inputs, see if it crashes. Um, it's surprisingly effective. Like even at that really, really basic level, truly random inputs, just see if your program crashes. You can find a lot of bugs. Certainly you could find a lot of bugs um, in the past before fuzzing was a broadly applied discipline. Um, so it's evolved a lot from its initial form of literally random inputs and see if it crashes. Um, but that's still the core of what everything that we're going to be doing today. So in a bit more detail, how do you go about fuzzing a program? First of all, you've got to pick what software you're going to fuzz or what part of a particular program you're going to fuzz. Um, work out what your inputs are to this program, as part of the program. Pick a tool that's going to help you do the fuzzing or write a tool. Um, make your tool and your target that you've selected work together so that your fuzzer can actually fuzz this specific target you've picked. Fuzz for a while until you've decided you're finished uh, and then triage all the, all the results. So this is what we're going to be focusing on. Um, a little bit of target selection. Um, we're going to learn about what makes a good target for fuzzing and what doesn't. Um, and then the core focus is on identifying what these inputs are we're going to fuzz, connecting them up to AFL, the buzzer, uh, and doing the fuzzing. The picking a tool bit, I'm going to suggest you use AFL. Um, and again, we're going to come to that. And I've already mentioned the, the triaging that we aren't going to be doing. To expand a little bit on that, one of the great things about fuzzing is if you found a crash, that's irrefutably a bug in almost all cases. You have some input and the program crashes. You've got a bug. You can use your usual debugging techniques to work out what that bug is and how serious it is. But unlike a code review or a static analysis tool that says, I think this might be bad, um, here you've, you've literally got an input that crashes your software. Um, so, so to some extent, triage is less important depending on who you are in the role. Are you a, if you're an exploit developer, you're trying to find a bug so that you can um, exploit this bit of software, triage is critically important. If you're a defender and you're just trying to improve the assurance of your software, triage is less important. Find the bugs, fix any bugs you found, fine. Whether they were exploitable or not, now you fixed them. So what is fuzzing good for? Um, Fuzzing will find you bugs that can be triggered by some input and lead to some crash. Um, that input probably has to be in some kind of structured form or some kind of data as opposed to um, someone clicking a mouse because uh, it makes it easier for the, the software to generate it. Um, and in particular, what fuzzing is good at is running a lot of tests, far more than any human will run. Um, we're talking tens of thousands of, of different tests per second. Um, there's a big list of examples here of different 
types of, of software that Fuzzing has found bugs in, um, and you see that they, they fall into these this category that they all take some kind of structured input, um, and a crash is, is usually considered a bad thing in any of these. So American Fuzzy Lot AFL, um, here's the blurb. I'm not going to read it. This, this is the blurb from the original author of the tool. Um, but some bits that are worth talking about. It's a security-oriented fuzzer. Um, you can fuzz for different categories of bugs. Fuzzing is most well known for finding security bugs, so it's particularly good at that. Um, and this tool makes trade-offs that focus on finding security bugs as opposed to other categories of bug. Um, it says it's a novel type of compile time instrumentation here. Um, in 2013, the end of 2013, about six years ago, when it was released, um, that was true, it was novel. Um, it's no longer novel. Lots of other tools have copied this, this type of compile time instrumentation, um, but it's still a good one. Uh, uses genetic algorithms, fine. And it finds clean, interesting test cases. Um, that trigger new internal states in the targeted binary, uh, and I'll expand on that in a second. Uh, so yeah, it's known as AFL or AFL. Um, a technicality, if you like, the original AFL is no longer maintained. Elkham um, Tuff, the, the original author, stopped working on it a couple of years ago, um, and now AFL++ is like a community fork of the tool um, that is maintained. So that's what we use when we talk about AFL. It's, it's actually AFL++. And why AFL specifically? Um, it's the joint best general purpose fuzzer. And these days you can have a debate about that uh, and you might have a preference for a different one, um, but it's certainly up there at the, as one of the best general purpose tools for fuzzing C, C++ and Objective-C programs. Um, what makes it the best, there's kind of two categories. It's effective, it's a good fuzzer, um, and it's easy to use. So what does effective mean for fuzzers? It means it's fast. That's a critically important attribute for any fuzzer is how many test cases per second can it run um, for a given target. And it's also clever, so it picks its test cases to, to run against the target with a very cunning algorithm. Um, and it does that trade-off pretty well. Speed is, is, is sort of supreme when it comes to fuzzing, but if you can pick your test cases well as well, then great. Um, and then easy to use is really important, especially if it's your first fuzzer that you want to use. Um, and AFL really shines at that. Um, provided you have the source code, um, then you can write a test harness for your tool and AFL will just fuzz it for you and give you some good feedback on what it's doing. The other primary candidate for best general purpose fuzzer in, in this category is libfuzzer, which is part of the LLVM toolset. Um, it's another great tool inspired by AFL, uses similar algorithms, um, but it has a different approach to test harnesses, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end, but it's another one to keep in mind. Okay, so this is the densest slide in this in this workshop. Um, you don't have to worry if you don't follow this. Um, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time trying to explain it, but just to give you an overview of how does AFL do what it does. So it's a coverage guided fuzzer. Um, we saw in the original blurb, it used a novel type of compile time instrumentation. Well, that instrumentation tells AFL about the code path that is executed on any given test case. So AFL runs the target with a test case and it observes what basic blocks within the program get hit um, and how the flow travels between those, those basic blocks. It uses that knowledge to inform what test cases it's going to run next um, and it favors higher coverage. So if it sees a test case that hits a new basic block that has never been hit before, um, a new statement, say, in, in the program, um, or hits it via a different route 
that, that hasn't been reached via before, then it will consider this new input an interesting input, and it'll use it in the future as part of its genetic algorithm um, in creating new inputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to skip entries that provide a subset of coverage. So if it runs a test case and it sees this test case led the program to do nothing new compared to previously, um, it hit the same set of basic blocks in the same order that some other test case did, then it's going to deprioritize that test case and probably not run it again in favor of more interesting ones. It also prioritizes speed. Um, I've mentioned already once, and I'll mention it a number of more times, that speed is really important when fuzzing. Um, so even if a test case is interesting for a, for a target, it hits some new basic blocks. If it's really slow, AFL is going to deprioritize it compared to interesting test cases that are faster. Um, because we want to run as many tests as possible, and we don't just want to run interesting ones. Uh, so it has some mutation strategies. I talked about the, these, these new test cases. Where do they come from? You give it some starting set of test cases, um, at least one, and then it has some mutators that take its existing test cases that it's ran um, and produces, generates some fresh test cases based on these mutation algorithms. Um, it can splice test cases together. It can just flip bits um, and, and lots of other ones. Um, you can also give it a dictionary. So let's say you're fuzzing something that has a, a JSON input. You can give it a dictionary and tell AFL um, curly braces and quotation marks and colons are interesting values for, for this target. Um, and it'll use that dictionary as part of its mutations. And this is a quote from, from the tool again. Let you read it. So that's another way of saying that there is no elegant description of how does AFL run that captures everything it does. Um, it is in fact a collection of hacks, um, but it's a collection of hacks that will find bugs for you. Okay, so before we get on to the workshop environment, uh, let's have a little pause. If you've got any questions on what we've covered so far, um, ask away. Uh, and then we'll move on to the workshop. This is the focus of today, is actually fuzzing software. Um, there's a pre-prepared environment for everyone who wants to use it. 
you can edit files directly in this remote environment, um, SSH in and then use a, a text-based editor like Nano, Vim or Emacs if you're comfortable with one of those. Um, personally, I like using Visual Studio Code's um, remote SSH plugin. You just tell it, uh, here's the, the host I want to talk to and then you edit as if it was on your, your own machine but actually it's doing all the editing on the remote machine. Um, so that's a good one if you like Visual Studio Code. Um, or you can edit locally, just like uh, any normal file. There's a couple of options here. You can um, clone the repo and edit using your preferred text editor and then SCP it across or rsync it across. Um, or just use Git, so fork the repo, make your changes locally, push them up to GitHub, and then on the remote machine, do a Git pull and pull them down that way. So lots of different options for what you want to do. Or if you don't want to use the virtual environment that's been prepared uh, and you want to run it locally, then you've got a couple of options here. Run the Docker environment on your own machine if you've got Docker installed. Um, there's a command line there that you can copy. Or if you want to install the dependencies and stuff on your host, then just clone the repository and, and get going that way. Um, I can't offer support for that scenario because everybody's host is going to be different um, and it's not a good use of my time today to do do Linux debugging challenges for everybody. So I do recommend you use either the prepared environment or, or local Docker environment and um, whatever you prefer and those are the ones I can support but the list of dependencies for using AFL++ is not that large so if you do want to set it up locally then by all means go for it. I'm going to send you all via DM an IP address and a password. Um, so if you check those now, um, and then you should just be able to SSH in as the fuzzer user. Um, and we're going to get started with the first practical. So this is the quick start practical. All the instructions are in the repository. Um, take a look at them under quick start slash readme.md. Um, and fuzz your first program with AFL. Um, AFL is already installed in the environment, um, so you don't need to do any of the compilation steps uh, for AFL itself. You just need to compile this quick start binary under AFL um, and then fuzz it, see if you can find any crashes. Um, okay, let's have a pause on the video. Um, I'll get back to you in about 10 minutes.
Okay, let's do a walkthrough of the quick start. So, got the quick start readme up. Right, so that works. So, what actually happened here? Um, I told Make to build the quick start program and I told it to use this compiler instead of its normal built-in compiler. This is a compiler that's installed on this system. It's the AFL version of Clang, the LLVM Clang compiler, um, which just has some tiny changes in it that allows it to instrument the program that we compile. We also told the compiler to do some basic hardening uh, modifications to the program as it, as it compiled it, uh, things like putting a stack guard on worked. So let's run it. Cool. And it compiled. And the vulnerable program tells me that it's got some features so I can uppercase lights. Oh, I cannot. Okay, that's because it's looking at it. It's treating these as bytes, I think. Let's try a pre-prepared one. All right, the pre-prepared one worked. Okay, a single digit, perhaps. Uh, Oops, uppercase. Okay, well clearly this program is full of bugs and it's not doing what it tells me it's gonna do, but whatever. Um, wow, yeah, it's full of bugs. <laughs> However, so we've got this inputs folder with some pre-prepared inputs in it. The one I just tested was this one. Um, and for those of you not familiar with this syntax, it says run the program vulnerable um, and its standard input, replace that instead of the normal terminal standard input, we're gonna give it the input from this file here. And so it takes this input, runs it through the vulnerable program and the vulnerable program outputs this. Fine, let's look at the head input. Okay, fine. This one looks like it's maybe a bit less buggy. Um, anyway, so there we go. There's a tool. It works. Ish. Um, let's find some bugs in it. So we compiled it with instrumentation. Um, scroll down to the instructions. Let's see. We already have some, some starting inputs, some seed inputs that will give AFL a head start on how to uh, how to run this program? I'm going to tell AFL to use an out directory and fuzz this vulnerable program. Off we go. Oh no. Oh yeah. Thank you, AFL. Um, so that's AFL telling us we've got a crash handler set up and we don't want it. So I've just disabled that in the background. Your environment shouldn't have that. All right, we are fuzzing. Uh, and we found a crash. AFL thinks we found four unique crashes. That number is climbing. Um, it hasn't actually found five unique crashes, but we'll come to that in a bit. Um, let's see how many instructions per second is it doing? Just doing about 4,000 here on this single core. Good, either way, AFL is running the vulnerable program with lots of different inputs. It is finding crashes. So let's call that done. Control C to quit out. And let's take a look at what AFL found. So we told it to use the out directory. Actually, let's open them in VS Code. <laughs> uh, 
just unopen them in VS Code. All right, here they are. Seven different crashes, all with different IDs. Let's look at the first one. Okay, apparently if you run the vulnerable program with this input, it's going to crash on you. What's that? Seven eights. Let's see if we can reproduce that. Head. Oh yeah, sure enough. Uh, so we got a seg fault and some address. So there's some kind of memory corruption going on inside this vulnerable program. Um, and if we go and look at the code for it, we might be able to work out. Excuse me. Why that happened? Find the head function. Where's the head function? There it is. Yeah, it looks like we're going to pass this test. Okay, and it looks like there's probably a bug here. Um, looks quite likely that this input here is not being validated at all, and then we're just using it to write to an address in memory. So we found a real bug. Um, well, an artificial bug, because I wrote that bug in. And if we wanted to reproduce that without typing the input in, because we'll find that there's various crashes AFL will find with some crazy input files that you don't want to have to type out by hand, we can just use this input redirection feature of bash again and run vulnerable with that input, and we see the same error. Now, a little tip. If you're trying to do this, I find it a little bit easier to just specify the number here and then put a star, so that way I can easily run it with different inputs um, without having to type out all the, all the different details in the file name. So you can see there's a few different behaviors of the crashes here. Looks like all of these are pretty similar. There's a different one. This is a stack overflow this time instead of a seg fault. Um, so triaging these crashes leave as an exercise to the reader um, you can go and find out what these bugs are in the vulnerable program if you want um, all of your reproducible inputs live in this crashes folder and that's that. that let's take a moment to look at this status screen in more detail because you're going to be spending a lot of time looking at this and it has a lot of important, interesting information on it and it has a lot of curiosities on it that you can largely ignore. So, top, uh, very top here, it tells you what program you're fuzzing in case you're fuzzing multiple ones. Um, this overall data and the process timing here is useful to know about. How long you've been running for is important and these two, the last unique path, uh, the last new path and the last unique crash are super important in trying to work out whether you've finished fuzzing or not. We're going to come back and talk about that later. Um, up here, overall progress. Um, a cycle is uh, a complete loop through all of the inputs, all of the mutations that AFL wants to do. Um, and it will test not just all of the inputs it's got in its initial folder, but it'll also test any inputs that led to a new path. And once it's done all of those and it's exhausted all its new paths, it calls that a cycle done and it'll go back to the beginning. Total number of paths, unique paths, it's found through the program. Um, so it may have tested thousands of different input files but all of those thousands of different input files only led to 15 different ways of execution through the program. It's also found what it thinks are five unique crashes. It's definitely found a number of crashes and its own heuristic thinks that um, there's five unique crashes. So unique here means took a different execution path through the program than any other crash. 
it doesn't mean what a human means when we say there's a unique bug. Um, and it's extremely difficult for software to identify unique bugs when we mean human unique bugs. Um, but it's a useful-ish metric. <laughs> uh, it depends on the program and on the crash. Um, in this particular case, it's definitely identifying the same bug via different paths. There's not five unique bugs that I'm aware of in this vulnerable program. Um, hangs, it also has a little timeout. I think it's, oh, I forget the time now, I think it might be one second, um, after which it considers the program to have hung um, and it will record that. Uh, much less interesting than crashes in most cases. Uh, let's see. Here's the total number of crashes, 152. Um, so that means there's 152 different input files that it ran against the program and they all led to a crash and they all fell into one of five different buckets of different paths that they fell. They went through the program. Um, and then the final area that's particularly interesting is here. The total number of executions, we're up to 60,000 here and the execution speed in number of test cases per second. Um, this is super important. The total executions is useful in the knowing when to stop indicator, and the execution speed is something you're always trying to maximize as you design your test cases and pick your targets, because the more test cases you run, the more likely you are to find a bug. Okay, everything else is not too important. Um, if AFL thinks something is important, it will highlight it in red for you. Um, so it's found some crashes. Uh, this is highlighted in red as a, an indicator that something might be wrong. In this particular case, nothing's wrong. It's just we're fuzzing an extremely trivial program, um, which is sort of out of the norm for what AFL considers um, should be should be the, the usual case. You can find out all about this data screen in AFL's docs, um, which we're going to come to. Uh, they're, they're really good for, for learning about the interface and indeed how to use AFL. Yeah, so just to recap, important stuff under process timing, important stuff under overall results, findings in depth, somewhat interesting, stage progress, we're not too concerned about the first two bits, but the total executions and the execution speed, very important. Everything else, largely ignore unless AFL tells you to pay attention to it by making it red. So now's a good time for questions about that quick start process that we just ran through. Um, you also might want to consider some of these questions. In particular, what would have happened if AFL didn't have that head seed file? Um, experiment with that if you like, just delete the file, move it out of the inputs folder and rerun AFL. Um, see what different behavior you get. Will it still be able to find the bugs associated with the head functionality of the program? Um, and if it can, how will that differ? And then if you look in the vulnerable source code in the vulnerable.c file, you'll see there's an Easter egg in there how might AFL ever find that? Is that something we can find with fuzzing? What are our options there? Um, and don't worry if you don't have time to consider these questions, we are going to come back to the answers to these later on. Okay, let's talk about test harnesses. So most programs that you want to fuzz, you won't just be able to do what we did with the quick start program, which was compile it with the AFL compiler and then run AFL fuzz on the program. Um, because AFL has some particular requirements on the format of the, the program, how it behaves, so that it can get its test cases into the program to be properly executed. Um, most of the time, you're going to have to write a test harness for that program. 
um, which is like a wrapper around the code that you want to exercise, that you want to test, that will allow you to hook up AFL to your program. So what does a harness have to do? It has to do all of these things that are listed here on this slide. Um, so first of all, it has to run in the foreground. Your program can't fork off and run in the background because AFL will lose track of it. Um, it has to just run and, and remain in the foreground like most programs do. Then it has to do some kind of processing on data it receives, either from standard input, um, like the vulnerable program did, or from a file, which is another obviously very common form of input. Um, and you have to be able to specify the file name like uh, on the command line. Once it's got the data from the file or from standard input, the harness needs to ferry that data to the part of the program that you want to test. Be it the whole program, you've just modified the main file, uh, the main function to uh, change where it gets its input from, or maybe it's just a function or a specific API within the program. Um, your harness will call that API with the data it's, it's received from standard input or the file. Once the program has finished processing that data, the harness needs to exit cleanly, so it just needs to quit. Um, it can't just hang around and it can't crash because AFL will interpret that as a problem. Um, interestingly, so if there's a if there's a bug in the in the program that you're testing that leads to a crash, then fine, AFL will detect that. We can do some fancy stuff that we'll cover a bit later, where you can actually trigger your program to trash to crash if you detect some kind of bad condition. Um, so your harness can do that for you as well. Uh, but we'll cover the kinds of things you can do there later. Um, if the program you're testing has checksums in it or some kind of integrity checks, like it does a hash over the input um, or there's a, it expects the input to be signed in some way, you need to bypass or otherwise disable those checks or maybe conversely fix up the input to pass those checks. It's usually easier to bypass them. So maybe create an ifdef um, and make all those checks go away in the program. Because otherwise, the fuzzer is going to spend its entire time, most likely, generating inputs that get as far as that check within the code. The check will fail, and that's that. And the fuzzer will never be able to get past that check because it's never going to generate a file that happens to have a valid signature or a valid CRC or hash in it. And then finally, your harness wants to use some of the cool features that AFL has to make it run faster. So these are the deferred fork server and persistent mode, um, which we're about to explain. Um, it doesn't have to use these things, but if you do, you're going to find more bugs because it will run faster. OK, so this is the harness walkthrough. Uh, so here we are in the harness folder. I'm just going to read through this readme file. So this library that's in this folder has a crash in it, but that's not really what we're going to focus on. We're just going to focus on how everything works. So this diagram here shows us all the different component parts. We're down the bottom here. We don't quite fit on the screen. OK, so let's see, starting with us. We start off by writing a test harness for our target. Um, we create this little, little bit of code, this little harness around the target. We compile the harness and the target using the AFL compiler. So this is the AFL modified version of GCC or Clang. Ideally Clang if our target supports that. And that produces an instrumented binary. And it's not exactly the same as an instrumented target, the, the original target file, because it's got our harness in it, our harness modifications around it. So there's our harness. It's an instrumented binary that we can run. Um, and we should see its behavior is, is very similar or potentially identical to a normal target if we just run it in the normal way. 
down here we're going to collect or create a number of input files to make our input corpus um, stick them in a folder often called input um, and AFL is going to use these as its initial set of test cases. It only uses them to start with after that it, it does its own thing with the test cases it generates. So as it runs it takes a test case spawns an instance of the instrumented target, runs that target with the test case as its input, gathers the coverage information that the instrumented target produces for AFL so that it can learn whether that test case was an interesting test case or not. Obviously, if the harness crashes, if I record that by putting that test case into the crashes directory. Otherwise, any test case that triggered a new state transition within the target gets saved into the queue folder. Um, and then it's this queue folder that is used as the source of all the test cases that AFL is going to use throughout the fuzzing run. So originally these, you would expect all of the input folder uh, files, the seed corpus, to cause new straight transitions, so they will all end up in the queue, and then anything that it mutates that leads to a new uh, state transition within the program will also end up in the queue folder. And AFL obviously has its UI that we monitor. And that's the overall overall flow that we've seen. Okay, so let's run through this process for this example library that's in this folder. So there's a header file that tells us that this library has two functions, an echo function and a, and a multiply function. Um, it's got some documentation that tells us how, how they behave. So we want to fuzz one or both of these uh, parts of the, of the library. The echo or the multiply API. Um, how do we fuzz it? So at the moment this is just a library. There's no there's no executable associated with it. It's just a library file that we can use in our programs. So we have to make a program that is actually executable. That program has to be instrumented so AFL can learn about these basic block transitions and see how different inputs lead to different behaviors within the program. So for that to happen, we have to compile it with one of our instrumenting compilers, one of AFL's compilers. And then this, this, this executable program actually has to take the input either from standard in or from a file specified on the command line and get it into this API. Um, otherwise, nothing will happen. And AFL will tell you, incidentally, if nothing is happening. If it sees no matter what inputs it produces, the program always does exactly the same thing. Um, it'll warn you about that. OK, so let's start with a minimal little harness that's going to try and call these APIs. Zoom in a bit. So here's kind of the, the minimal program you can might imagine that uses this, this library. We have some data, we echo it, and we do a multiplication of one times two and print that result. So we're using both of the APIs from this library in some basic way. We can compile that. Um, here's, the, here's the command line to compile it. Fine, we have a harness executable. And if you run it, it will print out some input data and it will hopefully print out the number two. We can't fuzz this because this program does not depend on any external data. It just does the same thing no matter how you run it. Um, so we need to modify it to take its input data. We're going to use standard in. Um, that's the kind of easiest one, in my opinion. Um, but we, we could have done this using a file name instead. 
So here's a modified version. We have a fixed buffer size. Picking the size of this buffer is kind of interesting. Um, so this program is now going to read in up to 50 bytes of data from standard input. It could be that we only hit bugs if we allow it to read in a gigabyte of data, but that's going to really slow our program down if we can read in arbitrary sized amounts of data. Um, so this is, a, this is a judgment call to decide how big you want it. Like obviously, most programs are going to want inputs much bigger than 50 bytes. In this case, we just picked 50. We happen to know that that's a good choice for this program. Okay, this is an important point here. So the input variable that we're going to use, we zeroize. We make sure that it's all zero before we read the data in, because otherwise we might have some uninitialized data getting processed, which will introduce a level of randomness that we don't want in the buzzing process, because we'll lose reproducibility because it means the library is not actually testing just the data that the fuzzer gives it. It's also testing potentially some arbitrary other changes. So this is straightforward. We read in from standard in into this input variable up to 50 bytes. We actually get this many bytes, length bytes, and then we echo it. We can see previously we were echoing this fixed data, the length of this data. Uh, here, we're echoing the data we've read in and the amount that we've read in. So now we are actually processing the input data. And in a more complex program, AFL could go to town on this and start discovering lots of different interesting paths through the program. This library, if you look in the implementation, is extremely simple, so it won't find many new paths. But if you run it for a long enough, it will eventually find a crash. Uh, the, the library does one thing uh, other than echoing the data, and that is crash um, with a particular input. So you can do that if you like, but it's not our goal here. One thing that's worth noting here, when we talk about the text here, is that the printf call that the library relies upon to do the echoing is not instrumented. So we are using the standard libc shared library, which we didn't compile using the AFL instrumenting compiler. We only compiled the library in our harness using that compiler. So whilst printf does lots of different stuff for lots of different inputs, AFL won't notice any of those because it won't see any changes in the basic block transitions within the program. If we wanted to fuzz printf, you have to compile libc with the uh, instrumenting compiler as well. Often that's not worth doing. You really want AFL to focus on the behavior of your program, probably not the behavior of the underlying C library. Um, so that's why we don't do it here, and I wouldn't recommend you, you try it for most of your targets. Okay, let's move on to fuzzing the multiplication function. So this is slightly different. So with the echo function, we could just read our data in and stick it into the API. But the multiply API doesn't look like that. It takes two numbers in. Now AFL can only dump a byte stream onto your target. It, it doesn't know that your target wants two numbers. It's just going to throw bytes at it. So our harness has to read that input stream and parse out two integers. So here's one way we can do that. This time we're having a, a hundred bytes as our potential input size. Have a bit of argument parsing logic. Our harness can now handle echo as well as multiplying. So you can run the program in two different ways. And so in the multiply case, we initialize our two two integers, and then we've decided to read in four bytes, make an assumption this machine has four byte integers. Um, 
So the first four bytes of the input are going to be the first integer, the next four bytes are going to be the second integer, and then we're going to multiply those. And that's it. So we don't need to tell AFL that that's what we've done. It doesn't know that we're multiplying numbers or that the harness is treating the data in this way. Um, the instrumentation behavior will learn this essentially. It will learn that only the first eight bytes are of interest um, and that any modifications it makes to data after that never leads to a change in the target program. But there is a, we do need to run the fuzzer in a different way because our harness now has two different execution paths. Well, three, if we look at these three different cases here. So here's the usual AFL fuzz command line, but we also append what function we want the, the harness to do, what function we want it to exercise. And of course, that was just a design choice we made we could have made the harness do both at once, read in some data for the multiplication and do some echoing at the same time. It depends what, what we want to do. Now I said earlier, we've used standard in here and you could have designed this harness to read input from a file. Um, if you want to experiment with that, then here's the steps you need to follow. Take the file name from the command line, open it and read that content into the buffer instead of reading it in from standard in and then pass that buffer to the to the target just like we were. And then the final detail here is, so we're fuzzing libmol, and we'll hopefully find some crashes, um, if there were any crashing bugs in this function. But what we're also interested in if you're fuzzing a multiply function is, is it correct? Is it functionally correct? So question there is how can we use a fuzzer like AFL, which doesn't know anything about the, the intended behavior of our target other than it thinks it shouldn't crash. How can we use that to test for functional correctness? So that's just a food for thought. We will come back to, to how you can actually do that later. Okay, brief aside about the AFL documentation, it's pretty good. Um, I recommend reading it all if you're gonna spend a significant amount of time fuzzing. Um, if you want some pointers to the best bits of the documentation, they're here. These three files are definitely worth a read. Um, possibly worth a skim through during this workshop um, when we come to our next practical, up to you. Ultimately, you don't need to read any of this. Like I said at the beginning, AFL is a batteries included tool which doesn't have too many knobs to tweak. So. You don't need to know anything more than, than we're actually going to work through in today's workshop. Um, but know your tools and all that. If you're going to do it, use it a lot, then it's worth a read.
Okay, so now we've got uh, five different features or so of AFL to cover um, that are going to allow you to really tackle most of the, of the real-world targets you're going to come across um, and find real bugs. Um, and then once we've covered those, we will go on to the real challenges, the main challenges. All right, first feature, LLVM mode. Um, so AFL comes with a GCC compiler, a modified GCC compiler, and a modified Clang compiler. Um, where possible, you want to use the Clang compiler because it allows you to use LLVM mode. Um, these are the two features I just mentioned, deferred fork server and persistent mode, both of which allow you, with most targets, to significantly speed up your execution. So deferred fork server says to AFL, only fork off a new process once you've reached this point in the program during the startup of the program, which means that any significant work the program does to start up, reading in config files, um, initializing variables, doing whatever it does, you can amortize that so it only happens once and then AFL takes a snapshot of the program and starts forking off its copies. So you need to find the point in the program before the target has consumed any of the fuzz data, if you like, the data you're going to be fuzzing, the input, but after it's done any significant heavy lifting during startup. Um, and that's the point where you tell AFL, start your forks over here. And um, there's a little macro. You can see the, the actual details of how to implement that in that readme. Um, persistent mode will make an even bigger difference to a lot of targets. This allows AFL to not start a new process for every single um, test case it wants to execute, but instead it reuses a single process um, in a loop uh, for a large number, some hundreds of, of different inputs before it spawns a new process. Um, this is really helpful for fast targets because in fast targets, the process overhead can be a very significant part of the overall execution time. Um, so by doing away with that or by amortizing it massively, um, you speed up the execution a lot. It only works, though, for targets where you can be confident that at the end of an execution, you've reset the initial state. Because otherwise, you're telling AFL, run this loop a few hundred times with a load of different inputs. But if after each execution, the state of the program is different, then you lose that sort of reproducibility. And you might get a crash, which you can't actually reproduce just by running that input. You actually have to run all of the preceding inputs first. So persistent mode is great, but only for targets where you have some confidence that you can restore the overall program state to some initial condition, or there is no global program state. So LVM mode. Initial test cases. So we've seen a couple of these in the quick start. These were the, the files in the input folder, head and u. Um, they're also known as the seed corpus. Uh, the idea is these are a set of inputs that exercise as much of the program's functionality as possible. But it's also ideally the minimal set of inputs that do that. Um, because the fuzzer is going to start with these inputs and mutate them and splice them together and so forth, if you've already got inputs that are exercising a lot of the program, you're going to get much deeper within the program's state space than if you didn't have these inputs. And AFL was just starting almost from scratch. Now, uh, when you've got a moment, follow this link in the slides. Um, AFL can work wonders without a seed corpus. Um, the post here is from the original AFL author, Mikhail, um, and it demonstrates how AFL was able to discover the JPEG file format 
with nothing more than a JPEG parser. And it just did mutation after mutation after mutation, and eventually was producing completely valid JPEGs that exercised a huge range of the, of the JPEG file format features. But you don't want to do that. <laughs> That's not a good use of your CPU time. Um, it's kind of a very cool demonstration of what AFL can achieve. Um, but really, you want to find a good set of uh, input files for which to like kickstart your fuzzing. So there's some guidance here from the from the AFL README. It suggests your your C corpus should consist of small files. Um, uh, it's just a speed thing. The smaller they are, the faster it will go. The less there is to mutate. Um, and yeah, only use. So this is the minimal set of test cases point. Don't put in redundant files. More is not always better. More coverage is better, but more files is not necessarily better. Sanitizers and hardening are techniques that we can use to find bugs that would otherwise slip by. Um, so if your fuzzer generates a test case that causes the target to hit some bug condition, even if it's some kind of memory corruption or uninitialized read or something, there's no guarantee your program is going to crash. Um, these sanitizers add extra checks into the co compiled program that will detect conditions that are buggy conditions, things you don't want to happen, um, and turn them into crashes so your program won't just stumble on. Um, this is useful because a bug that you, your test case generated by the fuzzer hits, even if it doesn't lead to a crash, that particular test case, it's quite possible that that's still a security vulnerability and an exploit developer could turn that bug condition into some catastrophic security problem. Um, so we do want to detect these, these classes of bugs. So what have we got available to us? Um, here's four different sanitizers. Undefined behavior sanitizer, memory sanitizer, address sanitizer, and thread sanitizer. Um, they're kind of mutually incompatible, no, not all of them, but most of them you can't run together. So what we do is we run different instances of the fuzzer with different sanitizers on. Uh, briefly, what do these sanitizers do? Undefined behavior sanitizer catches um, conditions that aren't specified what, what occurs in the C spec, so things like um, some signed overflows or using null pointers. Memory sanitizer detects reads from uninitialized memory. Address sanitizer catches a whole bunch of different um, conditions around memory corruption, so reads and writes to, to bad memory addresses. And thread sanitizer catches data races in multi-threaded applications. They all slow your program down quite a bit. Um, I think address sanitizer has like a two times performance hit, for example. Um, but usually that trade-off is worth it. Uh, the, the sort of simplest form of hardening you can do is just by compiling with this environment variable set. With AFL harden set, when you do a compilation, it will turn on fortify source and it will use a stack protector for all functions. Um, this has almost no performance impact and detects some additional memory corruption uh, bugs. So at a minimum, you want to be using AFL Harden. Um, and in practice, what you want to do is run with a big mix of all the different sanitizers. So there's some guidance in the README as to how to balance what sanitizers you're using and also what uh, runtime fuzzing options to use when you're running multiple different fuzzers on the same target. Um, and the links there, you can check that out. We want to get the most out of our machines that we can. And the way to find the most bugs when fuzzing is to do the most fuzzing possible. So we want to use lots of machines and machines with lots of cores. Um, unfortunately with AFL, getting the most out of multiple machines and multiple cores on one machine is not trivial. Um, you can't just say, here's my fleet, please use it. Um, so we have to do some work. The, the basic mechanism is to run a single main instance. You run AFL files with the minus M flag. 
and then multiple secondary instances. On a single machine, you'd run one secondary instance per core, and then on multiple machines, you just run lots and lots of secondary instances. Um, on one machine, all the different instances share a state folder, so the, the, the out folder. On multiple machines, you have to periodically sync those state folders. Um, and there's some scripts and tools out there that will do this for you, that will cover probably your use cases. Um, you can see links in the documentation for, for these tools. The reason it's not built into AFL is it's very hard to come up with a way that will just reliably work for everyone's use case. So they, they decided to not do that. Um, and we've already mentioned when you are running multiple puzzles, we want to run them with different behaviors to, to get the most out of, out of our puzzling. Ultimately, for large scale fuzzing, you're probably going to end up using something like Google's Cluster Fuzz or Microsoft's One Fuzz. Um, these allow you to run on Google Cloud and Azure, respectively, and really scale your fuzzing in a, in a massive way. One Fuzz is pretty brand new. Cluster Fuzz has been out for a open source for a year or so now. Um, they will save you a lot of effort writing your own uh, hacky version of, of a large-scale fuzzing initiative. Um, I haven't used one fuzz yet, um, but I have used cluster fuzz. It's not super easy to use, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's not too much effort. If you are looking at using fuzzing seriously in your organization, then it's worth, worth looking into. Okay, dictionaries are a super important part of effective fuzzing. These are cheat sheets for the fuzzer to say, for this target that you're fuzzing, here are a load of really interesting tokens that are going to allow you to discover interesting states within, within the target, um, rather than just waiting for the fuzzer to stumble upon them with its normal mutations. Um, there's a bunch of different sources for these. So AFL comes with a dictionaries folder for a bunch of different uh, common file types. So if your target uses one of these file types, then that's a great starting point. You, you're kind of sorted. There's a cool new feature with the AFL Clang link time optimization compiler. It statically, as it compiles, finds comparisons against fixed tokens um, and builds those in to the executable in a little, little dictionary that it passes to AFL fuzz uh, at runtime. So that's neat. Um, it's not going to be perfect. Um, it's going to likely capture a bunch of stuff that you don't care about. Um, but for, for a zero effort feature, that's quite cool. Libfuzzer has another collection of static dictionaries that you can use. Um, there's another runtime way of dynamically collecting a dictionary for your target called libtokencat. Um, you'll find it in the AFL directory. It does sort of the same thing that the link time optimization auto dictionary does, but at runtime it looks at calls to memcomp and stracomp um, and it'll pick them up. And finally, of course, you can just go trawling through the source code. And now you know everything you need to know about AFL to start finding real bugs in real software. So here's a collection of six different real bits of software and one fake bit of software, um, all of which have bugs in that you can find with fuzzing. Um, some of them are very famous, like the Heartbleed one and the SendMail one. Um, there's a recommended order that you do these challenges in. They're all in the challenges directory in, in the workshop folder. Um, but tackle them however you, however you prefer. Uh, the libxml one is kind of a classic example of a perfect target, so that's where I recommend as number one on the list. Within each challenge folder, you'll find a trio of markdown files, readme hints and answers. Um, read all of these, I recommend, sort of, before the end of the workshop, if you think you're not going to come back to it, or 
at any rate, whenever you think you're finishing with the workshop, have a read through these different files. Um, they'll give you a lot of different suggestions on how to approach fuzzing real-world software. Um, as we do the workshop, start with the README. Read the README for, for whatever challenge you're doing. It'll tell you what the target is um, and, and set you up with how to compile it. If you get stuck or you just want to speed run the challenges, then read the hints file, um, which will give you some further guidance on how to make a test harness for this target and where to focus on within the target, that kind of thing. Maybe how to fuzz it, like what runtime options to use for AFL. Um, and then finally, if you want to see an example test harness um, and the details of the bug in some cases, then open the, the answers file. Um, but like I say, don't beat yourself up on, on reading the answers. Um, they're all there intended to be read. Um, so don't. it's up to you how you want to learn. If you learn best by solving the problems yourself, then stick to the readme and maybe the hints. If you want to read through it all and then go back and try and implement what you've read, then, then read them all. So we're going to spend a significant amount of time on this. I don't expect anyone to, to finish all of the challenges. There's, there's more than, than we would normally get through in, in the workshop. Um, obviously, you're free to, to carry on on your own machines post-workshop. After some time working on these, I'm going to come back um, and we'll go through some more advanced topics um, in, in using AFL and finish the, the presentation component of the workshop and then if we've got some time left at the end, I'll stick around in Discord and we can carry on doing, doing the challenges.
and welcome back. Let's carry on. I'm going to do some more, more guidance that's going to help you with your fuzzing. So first topic is finding error conditions that don't lead to crashes. We already talked about sanitizers to turn uh, tiny memory corruptions into definite crashes of the harness. Um, there's some other things we can do too. So crux of the technique is you find some automated way to detect the problem in your program and then you crash. So you think of some bad thing that can happen in your software, um, a user's able to elevate their privilege somehow. If you can concisely check for that within your software that doesn't require human intervention in any way, then you can run that test after processing the test case or during the middle of multiple times, however it works. And if you detect the bad thing has happened, then you just assert and cause the, cause the, the harness to crash. Um, so here's a few examples of where you could do this. One is you're writing a maths library or crypto library, you create a fuzzer for all the different APIs, and it runs the test case on your new library, and it runs it on some existing library. Like open SSLs, your languages, standard library, whatever. And it asserts that the outputs from these two, two operations are the same. If they're not the same, you've got a bug. You don't know where your bug is. It's either in the library you've just written or the library you're comparing against. Um, but either way, mass is absolute. So if a given input leads to two different outputs, you know you've got a bug somewhere. Um, you can find invariant within your own software, like this next example here from OpenSSL. The square of a number is defined as the number times itself. Um, so if you've got two different routines to implement that, you can just assert that the square of a number equals the number times itself. Uh, they use this to find that CV there in OpenSSL. Um, Shellshock is another famous bug from a few years ago now. I don't think this was found through fuzzing, but it's an example of the kind of thing you could find. Um, this was where environment variables within bash were parsed improperly or handled improperly. Um, so you could have found this by writing a test harness that asserted there were no writes to the file system um, and then used the test cases as inputs to environment variables. And people did reproduce this using fuzzing and I think found other bugs too that were related to it. So just to repeat, come up with conditions that you can think of that are bad conditions in your software and turn them into crashes manually. And then your fuzzer can suddenly discover them. Okay, some collection of extra tips. If you've got a network target, something that's listening on the network, AFL can't fuzz that natively. So the easiest technique often, um, certainly the most generic technique you can say if you've got a network target, is to turn it so it's not a network target anymore. Write a wrapper that listens to standard in or a file rather than the network. Um, some programs have an INET D mode, which is like an old um, Linux operating mode where they were already configured to listen on standard in because the operating system would convert the network call into standard in for you anyway. So if your target has INET D mode, then that's great. You can just run it in that mode and AFL will work natively on it because it's listening on standard in. Um, and final option here is dynamically intercept network system calls using a tool like Preeny so that your target thinks it's listening on the network, there's no actual software changes there, but in, in practice, those read functions are reading from a file instead. I think I've already mentioned this one, you have to disable tech checksums in whatever form they, they come at, um, or else your fuzzing won't progress very far. The queue directory has uses beyond just AFL's internal use. Um, after a long fuzzing run, the queue directory ends up being a amazing corpus of test cases that 
lead your program to do different behaviors. Every single entry in there causes your program to run in a slightly different way. Um, you can be imaginative and think of uses for these. The, the baseline use for this queue directory is to do coverage analysis on it so that you can see what parts of the program you fuzzed and what parts you haven't fuzzed um, and therefore give you some, some ideas as to, oh, is there some configuration of this target that I need to change so I can hit these other bits? Is there some blocker that I can get rid of in the, in the source code? Um, coverage sanitizer is LLVM's coverage tool. GCOV is another one. Beyond coverage, you could just use this as a big set of automated test cases, regression tests if you like, um, that your CI line just runs for you um, in case at some point you you hit a hit, you, you introduce a bug into your software that these existing test cases cover. Um, but beyond that, see if you can think up of, of uses for a large, diverse set of, of input files exercise your software in different ways. Another tip here, if you interrupt a fuzzing run, just with control C, you want to go back to it, then instead of, you can run the same command line, but instead of saying the input folder is this input folder, just use this minus I minus um, notation, and AFL will bootstrap itself back up to where it was last time. You can't, its design is to be robust rather than fast, so if you do control C and then resume with this, you won't immediately be back where you were, you have to wait it runs through every single test case in the queue directory um, and it can do that so it can handle changes in your binary you can recompile the binary in between doing this i said we're not going to cover triage in any great detail um, but here are some very brief tips so address sanitizer traces can be helpful they'll give you more information than just oh there was a seg fault um, apple teamin is a really cool tool that comes with afl um, it will take a test case and it will try and shrink it into the simplest, easiest to read form of that test case that still leads to the same execution trace as the original test case. So if you've got a bug, you've got some crashing crashing input that AFL has found, or indeed from any source, some crashing input for, for a target, if you run AFL team in on it, you will end up with a much easier to understand test case. Um, we've already mentioned that the AFL's unique bug counter does not identify what humans consider to be unique bugs. Um, so if you can, the, the perhaps the easiest or at least the uh, most effective way to tackle this and actually understand how many unique bugs you have is to fix them as you go along. So AFL has found a bug, you fix it, you carry on fuzzing and, and repeat ad infinitum until there's no more bugs found. Um, that way you don't have this challenge of, oh, I've got a thousand crashing inputs. What bugs do I fix? How many bugs do I actually have? Uh, you might have come across this already with ASAN enabled fuzzing. Um, you need to tell AFL what the amount of, what the limit on the amount of memory your target is allowed to allocate. Um, if you're using ASAN, the easiest way is to tell it you have no limit because ASAN requires it to sort of virtually allocate a vast amount of, of memory. Um, but there is a risk with this. Your target program might allocate a, a, a vast amount of memory and then your system will become unstable. Um, and that's not what you want. So usually you want to use a memory limit when you're fuzzing if, you, if possible. Um, it'll protect you against this system instability risk but it will also lead to false positives because an input could legitimately cause your target to want to allocate a large amount of memory and AFL will stop it and it will crash. If you do end up with a big collection of crashes, then you can write some scripts to improve the, the experience of triaging these crashes. Um, there's some steps you might want to run through with every single test case, like get the, the input and the output from the program, um, run it with different sanitizers and collect those, those outputs, get a backtrace from GDB, that kind of thing. So a very common question with fuzzing is, 
when do we stop fuzzing? When is enough? And this is a big challenge with fuzzing compared to any other kind of testing you're doing where you know when you're finished. Um, my preferred answer to this is never. We've never stopped fuzzing. We've never finished fuzzing, rather. Um, allocate an amount of resource towards fuzzing the software that you're developing. Um, and as the software changes, you just keep fuzzing it. Um, obviously, that's not always a realistic answer. And if you're in a different circumstance, like you're fuzzing someone else's software as part of a pen test or something, um, you, you need to you need to decide you've finished at some point. So AFL has a built-in indicator that suggests you might be finished, and that's the cycles counter. When the last new path found was several cycles ago, and there's no pending path, AFL doesn't have anything on its to-do list, um, it'll turn that cycle counter green, and you can use that as a suggestion that maybe fuzzing isn't going to find anything else. Um, it's certainly not always true. There's multiple cases of bugs being found months of fuzzing after after those conditions hit, but it's an indicator that, that you can use. If you want to stop earlier than it's gone green, it, it hasn't gone green and you think you've been going for a very long time, um, there's, a, there's an intermediate stage where it goes blue, um, which says, which it goes blue when the last new path was over a full cycle ago. Is another indicator. Oh, sorry, there's some other conditions before it goes blue as well. Um, it has to have met some minimum amount of fuzzing. Um, you can also look at the output of AFL plot. This is a really nice little tool that will show you um, your, your, the progress of your, your fuzzing campaign over time um, and just use your intuition to, to try and decide whether you think now is a good time to stop or not. Before you do stop, make sure you check the coverage of all the files in the queue directory, see what parts of the program you're hitting, and then use your judgment to say that, yes, I'm, I'm content that we've at least fuzzed all the bits of software that I consider to be interesting. Um, or vice versa, you identify some functions that, that aren't being hit and then you have to work out how to, how to hit those. Let's talk about some limitations of fuzzing in general compared to other means of testing. So we just talked about one of them. It's hard to know when to stop. You can keep throwing money and electricity at this problem and there's never a clean time when you can say, okay, now we're done. It only tests, if you're doing fuzzing, it only tests exactly what you tell it to test. It's not like a magic box that you can throw software into and it tells you, good, I've tested the whole software. It tests what your harness tests, which is the target in its exact configuration um, and the exact mechanism through which you, you feed your inputs into the target. Um, there could well be lots of other bugs that aren't being exercised simply because of the configuration of your, your harness. There's also some categories of bugs that fuzzing probably won't find. Um, and we talked about the checksums before, but there's, there's, there's no guarantee that fuzzing will lead your target to explore its entire um, state space. Uh, it's, it's pretty good at exploring state space that you never would as a human tester, um, but it's not necessarily going to get it all. And then finally, another one that we've also touched on. Fuzzing will only catch errors that your harness can detect are errors. You might hear lots of problems with your test cases that a human could look at the output and go, oh no, what a terrible security vulnerability. But if your target doesn't crash, then the fuzzer will just breeze on by and you'll never notice. So that's limitations of fuzzing in general. AFL specific limitations to do with this tool. Um, so it only looks for crashes. I just said that fuzzing in general only find crashes. That's not true. Fuzzing in general only find conditions that can automatically be detected. 
AFL's case, that is crashes. Um, AFL will only send test cases via standard in or files. Uh, you have to work around that with your harness. AFL only runs on Linux or OS X. Um, there is a Windows fork of AFL called WinAFL. I understand it has some challenges with latest versions of Windows, but I've never used it. AFL++ also includes Chemu mode um, and a Wine integration for that, which is pretty cool. So if your target runs under Wine, then you can use Chemu and Wine. It'll be slower, for sure, than, than running it natively, um, but you can still fuss it. AFL is designed around the assumption that you can build your target from source. Now, there's these days, there are actually lots of other mechanisms that come with AFL++ that allow you to fuzz binary-only targets. There's a, there's a readme on this within the, the docs. Chemu is the kind of the, the default mode. I believe you can get pretty good performance with Chemu um, and its persistent mode, only like half the speed of native fuzzing, something like that, which is pretty cool for, for being able to fuzz targets that you can't compile. Um, and there's some other options that are significantly slower, but they will work for non-Linux uh, targets as well, like Unicorn and Dynamo Rio. So AFL, we're going to get stuck on magic values. Um, again, not, not quite the same as checksums, but just like magic bytes, for example. Uh, and we've talked about some different ways to do this. There's some links here. Auto dictionary that comes with Afro Clang LTO, lib token cap to find them dynamically, laugh intel. I haven't talked about it yet. That's a cool um, optional feature within AFL plus plus that you can turn on that breaks down multi byte comparisons into a series of single byte comparisons, which essentially allows Apple's built in mutators to discover what these magic values are. Um, so I recommend reading about that. It's really quite cool. Um, doesn't come with much performance impact, really. Um, So the coverage guided instrumentation of AFL helps it explore the state space of programs, but it won't help you, uh, the fuzzer find certain crashes. So whilst it might execute the code paths, and that's what the, gu the coverage guides it towards, if you see like this little snippet of code here, which can lead to a divide by zero if input is one, two, three, four, the instrumentation gives AFL no indication that 1234 might be of interest compared to 1233 or 1235. So that the only way it would hit that is just pure chance. Uh, and we talked about parallelization with AFL. There's nothing built in there, or rather what's built in is quite limited. Um, so you have to do your own thing, which can be a pain. Let's talk about what makes a good target to fuzz and what doesn't. So here are some, some attributes of potential targets that make them likely to be good things to fuzz. Um, parsers in non-memory safe language is the canonical thing you want to fuzz. Um, a C or C++ bit of code that is dealing with untrusted input. Um, it's been the source of countless vulnerabilities um, over the past like 30 years or something. Um, and it's it's really what fuzzing was, was built to handle. Um, other things that might make a particular bit of code a good target is legacy code. Might well not have benefited from, from modern uh, approaches to, to writing and software and testing software. So you might well find a good cache of bugs in there. New code hasn't been tested very much. Good target. Complex code, likely to be hiding bugs. It's hard to write complex C or C++ code correctly. Um, code with a history of flaws. It's obviously a good indication that there might be more bugs in there. Code that no one else has looked at before. Again, 
fuzzing is gonna find you bugs. If you fuzz something that's never been fuzzed before and it has any of these attributes, you're very likely to find bugs. So what about what doesn't make such a good target? Um, keep going on about C and C++. You can fuzz memory safe code and indeed people do a lot because um, denial of service is a real concern um, and you don't want your software to crash. With memory safe code a crash usually just means a crash. It doesn't mean you're going to suddenly have root on someone's system. So the implications of finding this kind of bug are far less severe than with memory unsafe code. Um, but nonetheless, fuzzing memory safe code is likely to find you less bugs and less severe bugs than fuzzing memory unsafe code. It's probably not worth, especially as someone new to fuzzing, fuzzing very popular pieces of open source software. Uh, so I've given some examples here of bits of software that really have been fuzzed pretty damn thoroughly. Not saying there's no bugs in there that you could find with fuzzing, it's just unlikely that you with a limited budget and a limited amount of time, both time and money to, to invest in fuzzing, you're probably not gonna find bugs in these, this kind of target. Is it worth fuzzing test components or non-production software? Maybe, if, if, you're, if you're interested in doing that, but you're not going to find security issues, most likely. Anything that would normally be considered a security issue, if it's in a bit of test software, well, who's going to exploit that bug? It doesn't really matter that there's a security bug often. And then I, I threw this last one in. I was trying to think, is there any software that doesn't take an input? Because if it doesn't, then you can't fuzz it. And I thought, well, what about a date? Uh, tool on Linux. You just type date and it tells you what the time is, so it's got some kind of kernel input that tells it the time, but maybe not much else. Anyway, it turns out that's not the case at all. Date has all kinds of inputs from environment variables and command line switches, and indeed has had security vulnerabilities in the past. So if you can think of some software that doesn't have an input, then it's not a good fuzz target, but most software has some kind of structured input. So where to go from here? You now know how to fuzz software with AFL. Um, and if you're not comfortable with it, hopefully you will be by the end of the workshop. Um, and the best thing you can do is just to start fuzzing software. So if you're writing software, write a test harness around it and use AFL to fuzz it. It doesn't have to be across lots of machines, or across lots of cores. Just run it on your own machine, do some fuzzing. Ideally, check that test harness in and get it to run in CI for some period of time. Uh, if you're reviewing something, if you're reviewing a colleague's software and you think maybe this is a minimal to fuzz testing, write a little fuzz test harness around it. Run it for half an hour, see what happens. Um, OSS Fuzz is an initiative by Google for which allows uh, open source developers to utilize Google's massive compute infrastructure for free. Um, they run their own fuzzers on a large list of open source software. Um, you can write an integration for open source software, whether it's your own or someone else's. You can submit a, a PR for someone else's software to integrate it with OSS fuzz. And if they find bugs, they'll report them into your issue tracker um, and you can fix them. Um, they've even included OSS fuzz integrations into one of their vulnerability reward projects. So just the act of creating a high quality integration, uh, it, it can be eligible for rewards. Um, I suspect at this point, most of the software that they care about has already been integrated. But if you find something that doesn't have an OSS fuzz integration and you think the security of this software is important for people at large, then, then that's definitely an option. I mentioned this right at the start. The other contender for best fuzzer, best general purpose fuzzer, is libfuzzer. It comes part of LLVM. Um, it has a different approach to fuzzing. Um, you write your test harnesses in a slightly different way. You just write, rather than your main function being the, the harness, you write a dedicated 
uh, LVM fuzz one input function. Um, and it has kind of two main advantages over AFL. One is that it's faster because it's all in process. It doesn't fork a new process all the time. So it's kind of like AFL's persistent mode, but all the time. Um, and the other is that it's more well suited for integration into automated pipelines because it crashes on the first, or it stops executing on the first crash it discovers rather than AFL with its nice interactive text UI, LVM or libfuzzer just is a runs with very little output until it finds a bug or doesn't, in which case it just carries on. So definitely worth checking out. Um, I mentioned OSS fuzz. The test harnesses you have to write for OSS fuzz are libfuzzer test harnesses. Okay, and that's all I've got to talk about for today. Um, before I go through this list of resources that you might find useful, I'm going to highlight the thing in red. Please go to this URL. I'll paste it in Discord as well. Um, your feedback helps me make this workshop better. If there's anything you liked about this workshop, you can probably thank past attendees for their feedback for, for making it good. Okay, so where can you learn more if you want to learn more? I've already mentioned AFL's documentation. It's really good. It's probably your, your first place you should start if you like this um, and you want to learn more about it. Libfuzzer, there's some links there and, and people have done tutorials and workshops on how to use that. This video I recommend uh, give you a good, good overview of how one experienced fuzzer uses AFL um, at, a, at a fairly large scale. Uh, there's a mailing list where you can ask questions about using AFL and search and find other questions that other people have asked in the past. There's this Smart Fuzzer Revolution talk, which gives you a nice idea on what's happening in the world of fuzzing and the move towards structured fuzzing. Um, this Fuzzing Art Science and Engineering paper is like a systemization, systemization of knowledge paper uh, that covers a lot of the advancements in fuzzing over the past few years. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in the academic side, this is the best place to start for sure, rather than just searching Google Scholar or whatever for, for different papers. There's lots of papers on fuzzing. This is a nice coagulation of them to one place. Uh, there's a fuzzing book, free open online book that has broad coverage of the fuzzing topic. So not just AFL or libfuzzer, but fuzzing in general. Uh, there's some more challenges if you like these challenges and you want to try and uh, fuzz some other targets and see if you can find the bugs then there's a link there that'll take you to some for more information on how to triage the crashes you find with fuzzing um, there's a link there to a blog post that someone has uh, some good guidance on how you might approach that challenge and then here's links to cluster fuzz and one fuzz for if you want to deploy a lot of compute resources or expose a nice, easy, relatively easy to use interface to other people within your organization uh, for doing fuzzing on your, on your own infrastructure. Uh, these two options are your best bets. And that's everything. So the workshop doesn't end just now. Um, if you're finished, then I hope you enjoyed it. If not, carry on working on the challenges. Um, and we'll be there in Discord to the end. Thanks very much.